something about the sea, about the ships on the sea, about the men who sail these ships. There's something that never changes. Ships themselves change. The men who sail the ships change. But the sea and the feeling men get for their ships, these things never change. No, sir. I told you I'm not taking that new ship. I'm staying on the voyage. You can get another ship Look, for Jack, it. I want you to take the new ship. The Voyager will be retired one of these days, within a few years. You're at the right age now to take on a new ship. I don't know that you would be in another five years. And maybe I'll retire. Oh, stop this foolish talk. Well, you've got 25 years ahead of you. Yeah, but I don't have to spend them on the sea. Jack, I want you to make one more trip on the Voyager. And then I want you to start living with a new ship. She'll be launched in six or seven months. I am not taking that ship. You are making one more trip on the Voyager. Then you are going to talk to the men who make the propulsion and electrical equipment. Then you're going to the shipyards and you're going to live with that ship until she's launched. Are you ordering me to do this? I guess I am. Then I guess you ought to know I'll do anything you order. And after that ship is launched, you can find yourself a chief engineer for it. I just talked to him. I think so. I mean, I think he'll take the new ship. Oh, I think I know him well enough for that. Now look, Andrews is the man for this job. He's the best man we have. Yeah. He's sailing at noon today for his last trip on the Voyager. Yeah. Hold on. this glass? Why, uh, I don't know. I You're just... new aboard this ship, aren't you? Well, let me tell you something. Those dials are to be kept spotless as long as you're on my ship. Now, clean it. Not with that rag, you nitwit. Use your handkerchief. But I haven't got a handkerchief. Then use your shirt tail. All the dim-witted things I've seen. Hey, what's up with the chief? I didn't even touch this glass. Sailor, you just learned that no one ever touches a piece of glass in Jack Andrews' engine room. It's the worst crime you can commit. Better clean it right. He'll be back. be driven by a cross compound geared turbine. Of course, this unit's already been installed at the shipyard, but we have some similar ones in various stages of manufacture. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take you through the shops first and show you some of the steps in manufacturing these units. It's all right with you. Whatever you say. But I tell you, before we start, I'm not too interested in how you make this stuff. Oh, you'll be interested in this, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure you don't make equipment the way they used to. The ship I'm off still runs like a top after more than 30 years. Well, you're right. We don't make apparatus the way we used to. We make it a lot better nowadays. What ship are you on, anyway? The Voyager. The Voyager? We provided the propulsion equipment for that ship. And the electrical equipment, too. I know you did. Well, come on. Let me show you what goes into this apparatus. Okay. The forgings we use for turbine rotors are of the highest quality. 
They come in here as rough barrel forgings like this one on the floor. And we machine the wheels on them in our big lathes. That's quite a micrometer he's using there. Yes, it is. You won't see many that size. Now, they make periodic readings on the rotor all through this machining operation. Every forging we use is thoroughly tested to make certain there are no flaws. That man is running an ultrasonic test. He sends a high-frequency signal into the core of the rotor and can tell if there are any imperfections by how fast the signal returns to the surface. Flaws show up as distortions of the straight-line pattern on the screen of the test equipment. What do you do if you find a flaw? We reject the forging. Not one rotor has ever passed this ultrasonic test has failed in service. And every forging we use takes this test. That's not the only test. Here's one of the furnaces we use for heat stabilization checks. The rotor in it is being tested to ensure that it runs true at all temperatures. If the finally machined rotor goes out of shape by more than one thousandth of an inch, the rotor is not acceptable. Those forgings are for rotors used in propulsion turbines. And over here, we machine rotors that are used in turbine generator sets. Yeah, I can see the difference. Watch it. The operator on that lathe there machines the dovetails on the wheels of the rotor to a tolerance of two-tenths of a thousandth of an inch. The dovetails on the buckets meet the same tolerances. Uh-huh. Now, two-tenths of a thousandth of an inch is about the thickness of a human hair. A part like this has to be precision built if it's going to be dependable. Now, we fit the buckets by hand to assure full accuracy. Mind if I look at one of these? Yeah, sure. Now, here's one of the buckets. These dovetails match the rotors perfectly. Looks like fine work. Yes, it is. This whole assembly is put together like a fine watch. Thanks a lot. After each wheel, the rotor is bucketed and banded. It goes on a stand where it's balanced to within 10 gram inches. By doing each wheel individually, we're certain that the unit is in true balance when it's finished. This method of balancing is added assurance of dependable turbine performance when the unit goes into operation aboard ship. By the time the last stage is completed, you can put a dime on any part of the rotor, and with his measuring equipment, that operator would be able to tell you exactly how much it weighs and exactly where it was placed. A 10 cent coin? Yes, sir, it's that sensitive. In this test room, we check out bucket vibrations to make sure they're kept to a minimum while the turbine's in operation. I don't follow you. Well, you see, we determine natural bucket frequencies that occur in the rotor. Then, once we know these frequencies, our engineers can keep vibrations down by making certain that the natural vibrations don't coincide with those caused by steam impact from the nozzles. Well, I still don't follow you. Well, let's see. You've heard of singers who could break a glass by hitting a certain note. Yeah? Well, now, the reason the glass breaks is that the note's frequency coincides with the natural frequency of the glass. Uh-huh. Now, let's consider these buckets here as the glass, and the impact from the steam is the note. It's the same principle, even though these buckets are certainly nowhere near as fragile as glass. We just keep these frequencies from coinciding. The result is that we eliminate the major cause of metal fatigue and prolong bucket and turbine life. You did a fair job on the Voyager's rotors with this equipment. Well, actually, this vibration testing is fairly new. We didn't know enough about it when your old ship was built. Yeah, you still did a pretty fair job. How much testing do you do around here, anyway? We run tests all along the production line to make sure the components of these small turbines work right when they're assembled. Over here's our assembly area. There's a unit there being ready for test now. It's all assembled. Is there a TG set like this one on the new ship? Yes. This one is a Navy job for a new destroyer. Is there something new mounting it on its condenser? Relatively new, but it's becoming more and more standard. It has a lot of advantages over conventional mounting. The main one is that the rugged condenser base, which is supported on three points, maintains alignment of the entire set, even in the heaviest seas. Looks good. Yes, this arrangement is working out real well in service. From the orders we're getting, I'd guess that it'll be standard on all ships in just a few years. Well, we've seen quite a bit of these small turbines. In addition to the ones we manufacture for propulsion and turbine generator sets, we make boiler feed pump units and geared turbines used for fan drives and tanker cargo oil pumps. 
We run tests on these units that include setting and checking of safety devices, running balances, hydrostatic tests of pressure parts. More tests? Yes, they're important. Say, before we look at the gear shop, let's stop back at the office for a few minutes. Quiet. What the devil is that diagram? Well, that's the schematic of a marine nuclear reactor and turbine. Well, you in that business around here, too? Yes, we're not only in the marine turbine business, we're actively engaged in marine nuclear propulsion business, too. Tell me, with a nuclear power source, do you use conventional turbines and equipment? Oh, yes. Of course, the turbine design has certain special features for use with the reactor. But basically, the turbine and gears and all related equipment are the same as those used with other prime movements. Now, with nuclear propulsion, the power source is the reactor. Have you been in this atomic business a long time? Yes, our company has pioneered in this field of atomic energy. As a matter of fact, the Valacitas boiling water reactor at our Valacitas Atomic Laboratory in California is the first nuclear power generating station to be privately financed in this country. Boiling water reactor? Yes, that's one type we're building. An experience we've had with it at Valacitas supports our work in marine nuclear propulsion. Looks very much as though our direct cycle, natural circulation, boiling water reactor has excellent potential for tanker and heavy cargo applications. In fact, we've completed the preliminary design of three such marine power plants for the Atomic Energy Commission and the Maritime Administration. How big are they? Well, they range in size from 22,000 to 40,000 horsepower. The boiling water reactor system has the advantage of simplicity and lighter weight. That, of course, means greater cargo carrying capacity. What about its operating performance? How does it compare with modern plants? Well, it's at least equal or better in maneuverability and its capacity for dockside operation, and a core load of fuel will last three full years. We feel our boiling water reactor has the potential for the lowest capital cost of any nuclear plant, as well as the lowest fuel cost. As a matter of fact, we think it will be competitive with conventional power plants by 1965. Then you think there will be wide applications of nuclear marine systems? No question about it. Though it'll take time and experience to know just how widespread, but uh, we're mighty encouraged by our work in this field. We've also made extensive studies on gas-cooled reactors for marine applications. Now, as I mentioned before, we've been in this marine industry for half a century, and we're always working on designs and products well in advance. Uh -huh. Well, what do you say? You want to see some of our big gears? Sure, sure, let's go. Hey, how about some coffee? Fine. How do you like yours? Black, please. That's one of our new marine group controls. It's quite a unit. Well, that control can handle a 400 horsepower AC squirrel cage motor and anything up to that size. Master terminal boards in the lower compartments are standard equipment for installation convenience. Sure looks compact. Yes, it's only 20 inches deep. And the controls are completely front connected, which means the unit can be mounted flush with a bulkhead or starters can be mounted back to back in the enclosure to save space. Are those starters interchangeable? Like ones are. The stab-on feature makes it simple to remove a starter for maintenance, and this particular design allows space for additional units to be added after shipboard installation. Note the convenience of the door-mounted wiring diagrams. Another feature of this control is the ambient compensated overload relays. Chromated parts also provide additional protection against sea duty atmospheres. The doors are flanged and gasketed to provide extra strength and watertight protection. Yeah, those centralized group controls are real fine. You can use remote master switches next to the motor with the unit, can't you? Oh, yes. One of the big things about these group controls is that you don't have to install a bunch of individual controls all over the ship in remote, hard-to-reach locations. But if you want switches on motors or drives used frequently, you can get them. Like another? No, thanks. Well, the gear shop's right over here. Gear wheels fabricated in this shop. The rim and the hub are welded to the web plates here. Now, they're just setting a gear in place now. What are those coils they're setting the gear in? Are they heating coils? Yes. They're used to preheat the gear before welding, and also to keep the gear at the right temperature while it's being welded. 
Evidently, they just turned that gear over and are resetting it. This preheating is done to help ensure sound welds. Now, this heating is just for the welding operation, huh? Well, when do you anneal? Well, after the gear is completely welded, it goes to the annealing oven. Now, right here, we only heat for the welding. The chipper is cleaning the slag off the first welds now. When he's through, it'll get a magnaflux check before any more welding. All the welding in this shop is done, so the welders are using a gravity beam. That's why we turn these gears over. On the casing for the gear, we use big A-frames. Gravity feed give you a better weld? Yes. Takes a little more time, but you can't beat it. Now, it's going to magnaflux that last weld now. They do a little section at a time. Now, that red dust will show any cracks in the weld when the section is magnetized. You run enough checks? Yes, we do. Before that gear gets any machining on the hoppers, it gets a Brunel hardness test, an ultrasonic check, and regular production inspection. Three welders work on the assembly at the same time. Now watch. They'll strike their arc simultaneously on the hub. They each have a section to work on. And they work at as near the same pace as possible to make sure no distortion takes place. Well, you fellas seem to know what you're doing around here anyway. Been making these gears for a long time, and we know they have to be just right. This welding process is extremely important. When the gear wheel goes on the hobbing machine, it has to be perfect. Now, you'll see why when we get a look at the hobbers. The shaft is pressed into the gear after the webs and plates are welded. And before it goes on this gap lathe, down this line, we have some of our big equipment. On this lathe, the gear rim is machined absolutely true with the shaft. The rim face on which the wheel will rest during hobbing is machined to within two-tenths of a thousandth of an inch to the shaft. After it gets off the gap lathe, the gear goes on this big balancing stand where it's dynamically balanced. Here's one of the largest and most accurate gear hoppers in the world. It looks it. How big a gear will it take? It's a 200-inch machine. Notice the two stanchions that allow both helixes to be hobbed at the same time. Now, these machines were designed and built by General Electric to get the accuracies required in marine service. This hopper can take a 17-foot gear and machine it to tolerances of two-tenths of a thousandth of an inch between teeth. What's a gear like that weigh? Oh, 35, 40 tons, I'd guess. And you machine it to two-tenths? That's right. This whole area is air-conditioned and temperature-controlled to make certain of the machining operation. There's no room for error with a marine gear. We make them with all possible care. After finish hopping, the gear teeth get their final finish in the shaving machine. These machines are unique, too, in that they were developed by General Electric in conjunction with the machine tool manufacturer for this specific application. The casing for the gear is made in three sections, and each of them is machined separately. But when they're joined, the fit is perfect. That man is checking a joint with a feeder gauge. Say, can we take a look at that gauge? Right. Thanks. If this gauge can enter a joint, the sections are taken apart and reworked. All the bits have to be perfect. Thanks a lot. Okay. Here's a machinist drilling the surface of a section where it'll be joined. That machine, all of them in this area, is set on its own foundation independent of the building. This means that vibrations in the building don't affect the machining operation. Let's go upstairs where we can get a good look at the assembly operation. All right. Well, up here you can get a better view of what's going on. Yes, you can. Now, the first step in the final gear assembly is the seating of the bearing. Now, the arbor that's being lowered into the casing there is used to check the machining of the boring and the casing. You can see it's coated with a blue dye. When it's set in the boring, the men will rotate it. Then the machinist will work the bearing seat by hand until it's perfect for the bearing. If the boring isn't true, the dye from the arbor will be left on the casing. Here's something. They're lowering a big bull gear into a casing. You can see the bearing is in place. When all the components in the gear assembly reach here, we know they'll go together just right. 
That's the reason for all the tests and checks you've seen. Even so, we check the completed assembled unit before shipping it. You tear it down then and ship it. What happens to all that accuracy when it's put together at the shipyard? We forward a complete set of detailed measurements to the shipbuilder. There's a unit on a test stand now. The measurements are made at every phase of our assembly here. At the shipyard, they check out their assembly against ours. They know the gear is perfect when their readings match the ones we send. Well, I'll tell you, you fellas don't leave much to chance. Well, Mr. Andrews, you've just had our dollar and a quarter tour. I wish you had some more time so you could see our labs and some other shops. Oh, no, thanks. That feet are killing me now. Anyhow, my orders are to be at the shipyards tomorrow. Oh, you'll meet some of our field engineers down there. Oh, you mean your installation and service engineering people. They're your best salesmen, those fellas. I meet one of them about every time we get into port. Yes, these... Field engineers travel all around the world, well, as you probably know better than I do. Sure do. Well, I, I sure hope you enjoy your new ship, now that you've had a chance to see how some of the equipment is manufactured. I tell you, I wouldn't bet at all that I'll be enjoying my new ship. Right now, I'm following orders. I'm just going down to the shipyards to see what's going on. There was plenty to see when he arrived. He couldn't help but be impressed by the new ship. By the latest equipment, like the max speed cargo winch drive, which provides fast, sure operation through a range of five hoisting and lowering positions. Utilizing the fast response and smooth acceleration of a DC motor, this all-electric drive handles the heaviest loads easily, accurately, and with optimum speed. As the days, then weeks went by, he came to know the new ship. The modern switchgear equipment. And turbines he had seen at the factory. He came to know everything about the ship. After a few months, the engine room bore his stamp. It was spotless. <laughs> you were with me on my last trip on the old voyage here, weren't you? You bet, Chief. Did you learn anything? You bet, Chief. What did you learn? The old voyager is quite a ship, Chief. Anything else? That you really like the old voyager, Chief. That you didn't want to leave it, Chief. Oh? And why not? Because they don't make ships the way they made the old Voyager, Chief. Uh-huh. Tell me, didn't you learn anything else? Oh, you mean about nobody getting the dials in the Voyager's engine room fouled up? <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> Listen, you nincompoop, turn around and look at that dial. 
See those fingerprints? Well, wipe them off there. I got a handkerchief, Chief. Well, use it. And once more, just once more, let me see you around here with dirty dials and I'll beat you to the fish. And one more thing you remember while you're on my ship. They don't make ships the way they used to. They make them better. A lot better. You bet, Chief. Man. Man, he just never will change. Oh, my gosh.